Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen W. Long. This is The Writing Life. And, uh, you know, if you watch the show periodically, you know we get to talk to a lot of authors. Uh, every once in a while, we get to talk to an editor, and rarely we get to talk to somebody who's both. And today is such a day. Uh, Margaret Stuckey is with us. I'm, I knew that. That's Maggie okay. Stuckey. Yeah. yeah. I was making it more formal. I'm That's sorry okay. about that. Actually, I, Maggie is a name I gave myself. I'm oh, not you a Margaret. Did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. I, I had an Aunt Margaret, and that's why I made that mistake. It's okay. But welcome. Thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I'm having yeah. a good time. Good. Well, we're going to do uh, kind of a, a two-part here to, to cover both of those okay. areas. But let's start with author. Okay. And uh, you told me before we got started, you wrote your first book early on. You, you were in college. I did. I was, I was in the landscape design program at Portland Community College. Okay. And one of their classes is indoor plant materials, house plants. Okay. And you have a lot, you have a lot of plants to learn in order to pass that class. And I created uh, what we today would call a flow chart of the different plants. Really? Okay. And I gave it to the instructor saying, you might find this useful in the future. And she said, you should write something about this. And we ended up writing a book together, oh, she and boy. I, she and I, which was self-published. Mm -hmm. Now, this is many years ago when self-publishing is very different. I don't know that we had that term then, um, vanity press, which, which no, really it isn't. No, not, it, it wasn't even a vanity press okay. because we didn't use a company like that. Oh, okay. We used my knowledge and my skills of the publishing world and gotcha. the graphic design world okay. and hired independently, a typesetter, an illustrator, really? found a printer, did all that stuff. And then at the end of all that, you have boxes of books okay, <laughs> right? Sure. that you got to do something right. with. I had come from advertising, so I knew quite a bit about promotion and marketing, and I promoted the bejesus out of that thing. Okay. It just covers Oregon and Washington, and we sold in those two states 10,000 books which I now know was fairly astonishing. Oh, you bet. At the time, I thought, <laughs> okay, that's nice. And that was really the start of it. Um, I never did anything really with the landscaping certificate per se, but because gardening is love of mine, a lot of my books since then have been in the gardening, botanical, right. horticulture world. You know what uh, I just thought of when you said that? Uh, Steve Jobs yeah. said that, that there's nothing that you encounter that goes to waste. That's right. And it sounds to me like this was really sort of a fundamental or a foundation for what you, what you went on to do. And, and it, you, following that same idea, it, I built on what I already knew right. to get to that first book. And then I used that first book to go elsewhere. It's, it's like everything else in life. One thing leads to another, leads to another. Right. You don't always know at the beginning where it's going to go. No. But if you're conscious of at least a vague idea of what you want, you can, you can make it lead you in the right direction so you don't waste years doing okay. something else. I was actually going to go a different way with that. And, okay. And, uh, and you may, uh, and may, it may be me, maybe I haven't had the this, this success of predicting. Mm. Uh, it seems like so often we think we know where we want to go or we think we know the, the, the path that's going to be the logical progression of, right. of whatever we've done. And in fact, there are little, you know, little diversions and bumps and, and, uh, and you discover things. So then yeah. you wind up right. in sort of a different place than you thought, but it's just fine. And what you learned along the way is absolutely valuable. Right. But, but if you do have... I mean, we could debate this for a long time, but I know you probably don't want to spend too much more time on it. If you do have at least a semi-clear idea of where you want to be, then each individual experience, what you want to, you want to suck out of it, that right. part of that experience right. that right. will help you get to right. the next step. And so I'm going to kind of flip-flop here and say, okay. I think uh, that, that I agree with. And that is, if you don't have a goal then you just wander. Right. And maybe then these experiences aren't wholly in line with, with uh, right. your goal. 
part of it is, and you can use that, extract that, and, right. and use it to move on. Right. Okay, so that was your first book. Right. You are the author of 11 yes. books, is that? That is correct. And, um, and when I say that, just for clarity, you've been involved in a lot more, but these are yeah. the books that you wrote. That have my name on the cover. Right. right. They are, with one exception, they all fall into the large category that book, the book publishing industry labels a lifestyle. Okay. Which has m many components. My focus is cooking and gardening. So I write cookbooks and gardening books right. for the general consumer. They're not, they're accurate, they're botanically right, accurate, right. but they're not highly technical. Right. Uh, in fact, one of my books is Gardening for the Ground Up because it's written for beginners. You know? Oh, what a great yeah. name. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, and I, I did a book called The Complete Herb Book, and I did a book called The Complete Spice Book. And that's, right there. and here they are. In each of those has a major section about cooking, cooking with herbs, cooking with spices. Okay. Because that's another, at that point, it was just a personal interest. And now I also write cookbooks. <laughs> so, you know, the, following your, your original theme is right. each, one thing leads to something else, leads to something else leads to something else. Mm -hmm. Is it, a, is it a, an aha moment? Is it, hey, I could do that? Or is it Sometimes. different than that? It's more a case, let me see, but how to, for me it's more a case of, because I depend on writing income for my livelihood, mm -hmm. largely, I have to be strategic about it. For example, people, I, I'm a big fan of mysteries for reading for fun, and I um, participate in a book club that reads mysteries, and people say, don't you ever want to write one? Well, I kind of do, but I need to be writing something that's actually going to sure. be successful in the market. I can't right. write just on a whim. So, what a, what a great segue, because you were telling me about QVC. Yeah. Tell that story. It has to do with this book right here, Soup okay. Night. Soup Night, um, okay. Soup Night was published by a company called Story Publishing, which is, some people think Storybook. It's S-T-O-R-E-Y, which oh. is the last name of the couple that started the company okay. Okay. 35 years ago. So, um, Story, shortly before I sold the Soup Night book to them, was acquired by Workman, Publishing, which okay. is one of the New York big guys. A lot of people, a lot of writers, particularly if they're fairly new, lament the fact that there's so much consolidation right. in, in publishing houses. So, in fact, in one, you, you'll hear people talk about the big five. Mm -hmm. it used to be the big six, and mm -hmm. then Penguin and Random House merged, and so now we have the big five. That's not necessarily a bad thing. And for me personally, it was a good thing. I was, uh, I was asked to appear on a, a show on QVC, the home shopping channel. Mm -hmm. They have a show called In the Kitchen with David, which is the f number one show and blah, 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 blah. Three hours worth of sales pitch. You know, they, they, sell, they sell stuff on right. these shows. <laughs> But in this cooking show, they have a six-minute segment called the Cookbook Corner. Okay. And every week, a cookbook author is invited to come. And I was invited. Now, the reason I got invited is because Workman is a big dog in the publishing world. There you go. And yeah. they had the good context. It was an amazing experience, I have to tell you, and, and a lot of fun. And staggering to me that in that six minute segment we sold three thousand books See, that's I could, breathtaking i could never have done that in a million years i could never have gotten on that show sure. on my own sure you need a big you need somebody big behind you pushing to make that yeah. happen maggie is there another uh, aspect to that uh being a benefit in other words this consolidation is yes okay they are um <laughs> For one thing, it keeps publishing houses alive. Okay. Because they they use the same warehouse facilities. They use some of the uh, same printers. So there's there's the economy a, of economy scale. of scale means yeah. that some of their operational costs are lower, 
which means they can pay their editors more because mm -hmm. they deserve it. Right. It means they don't have to be so absolutely worried to death about how much advance they can pay their authors. It means they can send authors on tour, you know, going around right. the country, calling on bookstores and stuff. There's, there's, there's more money in the till for the sake of the books because they've saved money on these ex external... The, the, the shared facility. The, the back, and, the back yeah, store. The back right. of the place is, work, works you out. You know, that's the interesting budget. because uh, I don't follow it like you do, but I've, I've thought about that and, and mostly I've heard people lament this consolidation, but in fact, that's a different look at it. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. And really then, the way well, it's an imprint, right? The different... Right. And because there's lots of imprints. Which used to be independent houses. Okay. And so actually when you open up the title page of a book, you might see a name like Delacorte Press, for instance. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at the back of the, co the copyright page, Delacorte is an imprint. Uh, I'm going to make this up because I'm yeah. not sure I can follow it. De Delacorte is an imprint of Random House, which is a division of something else, which is another division of Penguin Random House. You know? Wow. I'm not entirely convinced that it makes a difference because the imprints have the same focus they always had. They have the same mission that they always had. Mm -hmm. They have the same interest in the, the kinds of books that they always had. And to a large extent, they have the same staff they always had. Okay. They just, and maybe the same physical offices. They just operate on top of this strong economic base, which right. means they don't have to worry about, am I, are we getting the best prices on printing paper? Yeah. Somebody else is worrying about that. Right. You've sold me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. Now, okay, Soup Night, you, you're on QVC. Yes. But really, it's more than a recipe book, isn't it? It's it more is. than a cookbook. Yeah, it is. kind of talk about, because I read a little bit about yeah. Yeah. How, that, how this came about. It is, it, it is a cookbook, and there are wonderful recipes in it. But more than that, it's a book about using food to bring people together. Mm -hmm. I have a brother who in, in Portland who lives in a neighborhood that has a soup night once a month on their block, okay. which, which simply means somebody volunteers to make a big pot of soup, although generally they make two, so okay. the vegetarians don't have to suffer. And everybody, you bring your own bowl and spoon. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So, so nobody has a big pile of dishes, right? Right. So the first time I went, I stood on my brother's front porch and I saw this parade of people walking down the street carrying their bowl and smiling and laughing. It's just so charming. It is, soup night is a mechanism for bringing people together who don't know each other. I, right now, you know, in our in our country right now, when there's People are so angry with each other all the time. I keep thinking, I wish I could invite them all to a soup night so they could see what happens. You sit down at a table with somebody you don't know, maybe even somebody you think you're not totally at right. ease with. Right. Breaking bread with a stranger is a magical thing. I mean, and I watched what they created on their block, and then I started looking elsewhere, and I found soup nights all over the country created for the exact okay. same reason. And, and, uh, so and the book has stories about these other soup nights. Well, I was going to say, did you travel then? No, it to, was all by phone. Okay. Oh, but, but you did the interview. Yes. Yeah, you, yeah. you talked to those people. Absolutely. And I wasn't sure uh, these were existing. Yes. You didn't plant the seed. You correct. just found them. That's correct. How in the world did you find them? The magic of Google. Okay. <laughs> I put in every search term I could think of, and I turned up a lot of things. You, as you might imagine, I found a lot of what we would call soup kitchens, you know, oper oh, sure. operated yeah. by, by searches, although some of them do it in a very creative way, and I, there are a couple of them in the book. But I just found all these groups, and I eventually found my way to the organizer. Okay. Or the, usually they have like a queen mother, you know, okay. somebody who's really keeps it going. Right. Uh, and I interviewed that person and as many others in the group as were interested in talking to me. And often they would, somebody would say, you know, you really should call Anna in Boston because they used to live here and then they had to move and they started a soup night in their new neighborhood to meet their new neighbors and that, that kind of thing happened a lot. Mm -hmm. I actually found 50 groups 
my gosh but i only was able to firm up an interview with thirty of them and i of course since then i've found many many more i wonder if because of the book if they don't if possibly come to you rather than you going to them now so has anybody sought you out some yes yeah. yes um, particularly if somebody's wanting to start something new if, if i have it there are tips in the book about how to do it how to start one up but Sometimes people think their situation is a little different and they have questions. So yeah, mm -hmm. they do find me. I have a website and at the bottom of every page it says, send Maggie a message. So that's how they find me. By the way, I, I went to your website yeah. and it's whoever did that did a great job. I know, she's very wonderful. Colorful, she's very colorful. wonderful. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Yeah. And <clears throat> just to, not to, to beat this to death, but there is more to sharing a meal than the meal. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know how to say it, but... Oh. Um, you know, it's it's ages old. Sure. It's what people. Well, did. we say to break bread and. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I just think we need it more than ever. More than ever. Amen to that. Yeah. yeah. And what we we've got some. If if I could wave a magic wand and start a soup night in every neighborhood in every yeah. county around the country, I would do it. Yeah. See, you can't believe. Well, you can believe because I can tell you're already thinking right. about it. The difference it makes in how people treat each other. And then how they treat their larger environment, and then how they treat people in line in the subway, you know, yeah. it's amazing. What I happens. think, and this is a little divergent here, but I, I think what happens is uh, we respond to, as an example, social media. Yeah. And so you see somebody, John Smith or something, and he posts uh, something that's important to you, right? And you think, what a knucklehead, right? And then. Uh, but you don't really know John Smith. Right. And so if you could sit down and say, well, I don't agree with that thing that you said, but you know, here's an area that we can get right. together. Right. And uh, boy, I'm, I'm with you. Let's, okay. <laughs> let's do something. Let's do that, yeah. Now, we need to move on, okay. though. Uh, so we talked about the writing, which I, I, I'd like to not be done with that particularly. But uh, to get on to the editing, you're going to uh, do a presentation at the Mac Library. Yes. And this is for, if I say it right, NaNoWriMo? Yes. Okay. Actually, it's kind of an offshoot of that. Okay. Um, my NaNoWriMo is for fiction writers. Ah, okay, as opposed to yeah. nonfiction. My workshop is about how to write a proposal for a nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. And we scheduled it not in conjunction with NaNoWriMo, but sort of as an offshoot. Yeah. Just because <clears throat> people are already thinking about writing. Right. And I think both both avenues att might attract people who are just getting their feet wet, mm -hmm. which is great because that's the message that I want this workshop to carry for. I mean, if I don't teach, if I teach anybody just one thing, mm -hmm. I want it to be this one thing, that mm -hmm. if you're talking about nonfiction and you're trying to interest a, pu a publisher in your nonfiction book, you do not send the whole manuscript. You don't even write you don't the write whole manuscript. That, yeah, right. You send a proposal, and the proposal has to be exactly what they ex has could contain exactly what they expect, mm -hmm. and has to be damn good. So I'm I'm constantly dismayed when I encounter people who don't understand that they don't. The whole proposal thing just doesn't register with them. It's everything, it right, is, in the is, beginning. It is absolutely everything. Right. It's absolutely everything. The best description I've read about this, a succinct description, is that the proposal is like a business plan for your book. Oh, sure. The book is the product. You have to say what the product is and what problem it solves, who would need it, mm -hmm. who might be interested in it even if they don't need it right now, where they are, how you reach them, where they shop, how you get your product into some venue. So a little bit of marketing along with. Yeah, yeah. very much a little bit of marketing. It's, it's, so lay, lay that all out. And because your product is a book, the additional element is why, if this book is a good idea, a marketable idea, a profitable idea, right. why are you the one and only best one, person right. to write it? Yeah. And all that has to be in the proposal. Now. It takes a long time. It's usually 50 or 60 pages long. Is it really? Because it, it includes two sample chapters. The first, really? The first okay. chapter and one other chapter. And most people think that when they're finished with the proposal, the book is halfway written. 
The reason you don't do any more than that is you have to demonstrate that you have control of your subject matter, but you also have to demonstrate that you understand publishing is a business. These guys have to make a profit or they'll shut, close up shop. Right. And that you have a way to help them see how they could make a success if they were to publish this. Nobody wants to end up with just stacks of boxes in the warehouse, that don't, books that don't go anywhere. Right. They can't afford to do that. Yeah. So the proposal gives them the information they need to make a positive decision. Yeah. And so it's that, gotta that's be good. It's gotta so be good. It's, you, it's everything. You're not just selling the book, you're selling yourself. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. And, and I'm on the other side of that. I write fiction and, and like a novel has to be done. Mm -hmm. they, they, don't, they don't want no. to hear, no. uh, gee, I've got this swell idea. Yeah. No. Uh, so, no. you know, no. very, very different there. And this, but the same holds true in nonfiction. Nobody wants to hear anybody say, give me $50,000 and I'll write you a great book. Mm -hmm. you know? Unless you're Bob Woodward, you could probably get away with that. <laughs> but most of us can't. Most of us have to prove yeah. what, we, what we think we can do. Okay. Again, from yeah. your website, yeah. uh, you're an editor. Yes. And, and I think you said you picked that word because we think we know what that means. Right. In fact, I've got five things, yeah. five categories. Can you talk a little bit about that? Actually, the work that I do, that this is the other half of my writing life, is more accurately described as collaborator. Okay. That's me and another individual working together on a book. Okay. The other person's name goes on the cover, mine does not. By the way, these are all business books. Mm -hmm. as they're completely different from the other half of my mm -hmm. life. I help business people write their books. Um, I sometimes describe the work I do as that I'm a ghostwriter because mm -hmm. people have sort of heard that term. There is um, there's a range of it. The word editor encompasses a lot of different tasks and those individual tasks have their own name. Mm -hmm. People kind of in the you know, publishing house would understand the difference. Um, there is, if you're starting at the, the most serious level of editing, is called developmental editing. Okay. Because you're in fact developing a brand new book from existing material that has good ideas but is currently in unpublishable form. Okay. So somebody like me comes in and rips it all apart throws away half of it, rearranges it into something that's more interesting to read, makes mm -hmm. you want to go from the end of chapter one, continue on to chapter two, and sometimes that requires writing a lot of new material to tie the pieces together. Okay. That's why I, people often say that development, de developmental editor is also a co-author sure. because there's a lot of writing involved. One step down from that is what's called line editing, which is manuscript editing. The manuscript has been accepted by a publisher. Oh, it's okay. Ready, ready to go Different through part the, of the production process. process. Right. But you you cross out a word, and you substitute a different word for right. it. If right. you can sort of visualize when we used to do double spaced pages out of a typewriter. Right. Okay. The line editing is that. It's also a look for factual inadequacy in inaccuracy, mm -hmm. um, internal contradictions. If you start out saying this happened in 1983 and suddenly right. it's 1987 and four right. years haven't gone by, that, that cop the uh, line editor is working for that. The next step down is copy editing. And these, these happen in a chronological sequence as well as a hierarchy. Sure. <clears throat> the copy editor's role is Correct the grammar, correct the spelling, correct the punctuation, correct the syntax. Establish a coding system for the typesetter if they're... Really? Yeah. Like, particularly if there's a lot of levels of subheads. You know, you have to indicate that this, this subhead is subsur subsidiary to mm -hmm. the subhead, that part, and you do that with a code. Okay. Um, and if there are figures or drawings or charts or tables that are referred to in the text, the copy editor's job is to make sure they don't contradict each other. Okay. okay. And then um, a proofreader, when 20 years ago, a proofreader's job was to make sure that the manuscript, which came out of a typewriter, 
then went through typesetting that the finished product, the typeset product, matches the manuscript the way it should be, the way it should. Uh -huh. We don't do that anymore. I was, yeah, okay. Yeah, the technology <clears throat> is way beyond that. Sure. So a proofreader is essentially another copy editor, this one last chance to go through everything because everybody misses something. And most people miss several somethings. Right. So this is one last chance to go through it. Okay. And it takes a long time. It takes a long time. And you know, I was thinking, I am very near coming out with another book. Good. And, and I've, uh, I've told people, I read it 600 times. The 601st time, in a different format, yeah. I found things that I never saw before. Right. And I'm wondering, and I used to own a manufacturing business, and we used to say, you can't check your own work. Mm -hmm. can, can, so the copy editor, it, in a sense, you've done this twice now, or right. somebody has done it. Can that same person do it? I mean, at some point, this is not mechanical. This is a person looking at this. It's ideally each of those things that, that in that hierarchy that I just went through should be a different person. Yeah. If not, at least have a big gap of time in between. Right, right. Give yourself a little bit of a breather. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Ghost writing. Yes. You talked about that. I had a different concept. Okay. I thought that was uh, um, my years on the court uh, by Michael Jordan. Uh, and then with right, right. and Maggie that 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 is ghostwriting. Okay, that absolutely is ghostwriting. Okay, uh, there's a very fine line between ghostwriting and collaboration. Okay, ghostwriting start. The simplest way to describe it is ghostwriting starts with a blank page, or a blank screen. So I'm sorry, ghostwriting. Ghostwriting starts okay. with a blank. Right. Okay, it's it's the writer. Okay. And the author. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> sharing information and then the writer makes a book out of it. Uh -huh. Collaboration starts with an idea that came from the author who probably has an idea of how to, how to structure a book, but it's probably wrong, <laughs> probably not particularly engaging, right. and has not ma a manuscript but a bunch of stuff, a box of stuff. Right. Um, or I remember when le lecture yeah. notes. So you know, yeah. I did this workshop ten years ago, and right. this is part of it in there. So here, here's the box. Yeah. You make a book out of it. Yeah. That's collaboration. You know, uh, we haven't talked about voice. Voice is is big in fiction, and I think it is probably in nonfiction as well. It is. And maybe so in, in a business book, I would think it's less important. But if it's a uh, well, you have done something uh, uh, the Warren Buffett way. Yeah. Now. I would think that voice is important in that. It certainly, it certainly. I think voice is important all the way. Okay. Through. It's the way that you make sure the person you want to be reading this book can understand it, doesn't get lost okay. somewhere because you're talking like a college professor, you know, or because you're just being so chatty and so cute and wasn't it? It, it, it drives people crazy, right. you know. Um, voice is. That's part of the, the skill of ghostwriting is that when I'm finished, it sounds like that other person. And I guess that's... They that's can't tell the difference. After a while, they can't tell the difference. Right. So... Yeah. And, and this may be saying the same thing a different way, but oh, yeah. that... Uh, <clears throat> I, and I don't know that this book meant to convey Warren Buffett's voice. No. But uh, there's a consistency, for right. one thing, that is like... You'd almost say, "Well, who's talking now?" Right. And uh, but that there's um, there's there's a level of either expertise or uh, attitude. Maybe attitude is the right, right word. Right. And right. and that that carries through the book. It and does. and that it's the right attitude. Yes. So if I read something about Warren Buffett, I don't think it's a it's a joke book. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It, you're absolutely right. It has to match the subject matter has to match the there you go. phenomenal yeah. author. It has to match the projected reader. Um, the Warren Buffett way is not by Mr. Buffett, it's about him, right. by someone else who just analyzed his thinking process. Uh -huh. It was the first one. Since then, there have been several others, but it was the first one. Okay. That book was a New York Times bestseller list, not on the business list, but on the main nonfiction list, Boy. which is unheard of sure. for a business book. Well, I think, thanks to you, I suspect. 
I had a I had a role in that. I yeah. did yeah. because I knew the editor. In fact, the reason I got onto that project was it was this author's first book, and he was really? nervous, so he was calling the editor all the time. Mm -hmm. And that editor finally called me and said, "Would you just take this over?" And I got about halfway through, and I called this editor and said. If we, were in, if, it, if we were face to face, I would have been shaking my finger like this, you know. I said, whatever your promotion budget is, double it. Whatever your print run is, double it. And there was dead silence on the phone. And I said, oh my gosh, I really, really did now. But he said, tell me more. And he did. He jumped onto that book, which is the role of the in-house publishing mm -hmm staff person whose name is editor, their role is to make the book happen and to promote it and to get behind it and push it out to its greatest p potential. Yeah. And because he, he, will, he says now, because I said that to him, he focused on it and it was a gigantic bestseller. And it worked. And it worked. Maggie Stuckey, that's a, a great place to end this. Okay. Thank you so much for coming by. And and uh, good luck again with, uh, I, I want to come by your, your presentation. It's the, the 27th, uh, oh, which, it's is the 27th. Sabbath, okay. which is a Saturday okay. at 2 o'clock. And um, going to have a lot free. of good, it's free, yeah, it's absolutely yeah, free. Going to yeah. have a lot of good information. Great. I'd love to have a packed house. Yeah, I think you will. <laughs> okay. Folks, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what a great interview. I, I just, I get a kick out of this. You. You're terrific. Um, see us next time on The Writing Life. Uh, you can write to me at stephenwlong.com and uh, send me some suggestions. So thanks very much. And thank you, man. <laughs>